Hello, nice to meet you. Um, thanks for joining uh, our today's session. Uh, my name is Karol Gala. I'm engineering manager from OneMicro, uh, and today with Anders, I will talk a bit about uh, enabling uh, new, I mean, an ABK AFR family in Zephyr. I mean, the story of uh, adding the whole support. Uh, but first, we'll start with Anders explaining why we're actually doing that. Okay, so uh, my name is Anders Petson. I'm a director of mass market in Silicon Labs. And I manage community, training, partnerships. But above all that, also the tools ecosystem, which is the most fun part, to be honest. Um, is it anyone in here that doesn't know Silicon Labs? You. Okay. <laughs> so we're doing wireless chipsets. So if you didn't know that, that's good to know. Uh, so yeah, we are pretty new with Zephyr, and uh, we are taking baby steps. I was uh, looking at a presentation from ST, and I saw that they had 130 supported devices, 130 supported boards. We have two right now, so we are in, in the very start. Um, so yeah, we, we um, can be interpreted that we are behind, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of the backstory on RTOSes from Silicon Labs. So this is not the main theme for today, but we, we ha heavily support free RTOS and the Micrium OS. And for you who didn't know that, we purchased the Micrium OS uh, some time ago, uh, and uh, we integrated it into our stacks, etc. We, we had the choice to go for either free RTOS or the Micrium, but the decision was made to, we need to own because it's gonna be uh, such a critical part of our development, uh, so we, we need to make sure that we own the IP. Uh, was it the right thing or wrong thing? I let you judge that. Um, at that time, Zephyr was not even on the map. So what we did, we integrated these RTOSes into our tools because if you're gonna develop with one of our chips today, you practically need to have our tool suites called Simplicity Studio 5. And in there, when you are in, you have a very easy uh, way to integrate RTOS into a bare metal, uh, uh, a uh, bare metal project, etc. We have a lot of examples, and now when we're also having our um, Wi Fi chipset, we are also uh, integrating a lot of the AWS functionality into that. So um, that's where we come from, uh, and that's where we started our journey for Zephyr. So we joined the Zephyr project in 2021. But we started talking about Zephyr long, long time ago. And in the early days, uh, it was, well, it's always requested from the customers. But uh, you can imagine yourself that uh, we have stack development teams uh, in the company doing BLE, SIGBE, uh, Matter, OpenFred, you name it. And they're very proud of what they're doing. And when we uh, from marketing came and said, hey, can we run someone else's uh, BLE stack on our chip? I was thrown out of the room. Uh, so, uh, but we, we pushed and pushed, and we got to the point where we started to get a lot of pressure from our customers that this is the right thing to do. So we wanted to uh, uh, start our journey, and we had uh, in our development teams, we had a port here, a port there, and we tried to get it consolidated into one, and then we went to the Zephyr project and we submitted it and they laughed a little bit, said, no, this quality is shit. Sorry, guys, redo it. <laughs> that was a little bit of a humbling moment for, uh, for our development teams. But to be fair to them, they are not experts on RTOSs uh, in their professional life. They're doing stacks. So um, I've been working with Ant Micro for a very long time. And I said, why are we going to do this? This is not our core business. Let an expert do it, uh, and let's do it externally. So we got in contact with Ant Micro uh, after we joined uh, as a Silver member. And uh, we let them start the uh, development of, uh, of Zephyr. And I think, how long did it take before you committed the first one? Three months? I think, yeah. Yeah, like three months. Done. Boom. Uh, so our guys were very impressed, uh, and that's why we are working with a partner for uh, uh, doing the Zephyr stuff. So we have our first packages uh, available right now, 
Uh, all is built on uh, the EFR for the two family, uh, Series 2, uh, which is the mainstream devices today uh, that, you know, on the platform that we are developing. It's all based around uh, Cortex-M43, uh, and it's, a, it's supported, of course, in Zephyr, together with all the uh, peripherals. And we are using the, the Zephyr BLE stack uh, in all implementations. So we're using the HI layer to um, use that one. Our target is to support all the peripherals, so making a, a full-flown um, uh, implementation of Zephyr on these ones. Uh, right now, it's per board. It's not per family. So it's really the board that we are supporting. And there are a lot of explanations to that. Uh, I let smarter people than myself uh, talk about these explanations because, yeah. So uh, the ones we're supporting right now, it's the BG22 Thunderboard. Uh, the XG24 uh, development kit, that's a little bit more expensive, but it also has a lot more uh, sensors, etc., on, on there. But it's pretty simple to move to an, an Explorer kit or your own design, etc. And the latest one that we just released is called the BG27. Uh, it's uh, the bigger brother of the BG22. That I leave over to you. Thanks. Um, okay, so maybe let's start with uh, some uh, background why we're here and what we do in, in Zephyr. So uh, we've been with the project for quite some time. Uh, we are a platinum member of, of uh, Zephyr project. Uh, like commercially, we provide support for uh, for Zephyr and generally speaking, uh, doing things like you know uh, enabling uh, new platforms, but also uh, things around it, uh, and and uh, uh, providing software, providing services for that. We also maintain a Risk Five part of, of Zephyr, uh, so if you are contributing something there, it probably goes through us, and, and uh, we may be those guys who comments on your pull request and asking you to do things. Sorry for that. Um, um, uh, besides uh, work on a core Zephyr itself, we also work uh, uh, in the ecosystem around uh, the, uh, around Zephyr and around open source software. And one of the uh, two of those examples of, of that uh, work is uh, Zephyr dashboard. Uh, this presentation is basically uploaded to uh, to the schedule, so we can download it and click those links. Uh, so Zephyr, Zephyr dashboard is a place where you can go where we present results of a like huge CI building every single platform in Zephyr, bunch of, uh, like six of, of examples there, uh, and trying to run it in, in Renode, our open source simulator, uh, to get uh, uh, information if the binary actually works and, and if it gives the results. Renodepedia is something above it. Uh, it collects the data about existing hardware, existing platforms and allows you to easily uh, browse through it and, and see if there is a platform that you would need to, you would like to use, if it's supported, how it is supported, and, and so on, so on. So, uh, uh, as Andrew said, uh, within this project we worked on uh, extending Zephyr and adding uh, Silicon Labs platforms to Zephyr. So, how do you do that? Um, there is quite like an obvious and generic steps uh, uh, that you should follow. Basically, you can just read more or less about it uh, in the documentation or like, uh, you know, in books. Uh, but basically, you have to figure out where to add this uh, board. So you have to figure out how to make it as generic as possible so you don't copy the code, you don't, you know, have like uh, two targets doing exactly the same thing or uh, copying like startup code and things like that. Uh, Zephyr often uses something called hardware abstraction layers. This is like uh, often separate repository with some low level drivers from the vendor. Uh, so if you are adding a new functionality, you often have to uh, take care of this low level stuff and update it. And if you update it, you may break something in existing code base, so then again testing, uh, and besides adding new platform, you have to fix the old ones because you broke it. Um, and of course, update documentation uh, and uh, possibly enable people to program to flash the device. Because Zephyr comes with a pretty handy uh, tool called West, and if you want to flash a device, you just call West Flash, and it's, it's supposed to just load the program. Uh, but if your new device needs some programmer uh, that is not yet supported, you have to add it. So 
does the theory looks pretty pretty uh, pretty okay um, so when we started working on uh, this project this particular project as Anders said there was already work in progress uh, pull request with some code uh, uh, adding the functionality but the code required some care uh, uh, so basically we had to uh, go through it figure out like what's there uh, first of all um, update it to, to follow the standards uh, Zephyr standard like coding guidelines and then so on uh, second of all divide it into smaller chunks because it was like a huge pull request adding uh, uh, all the things at once take care of li licensing so we'll talk about it uh, in a moment um, and since the pull request uh, uh, were, was open before we actually started, uh, it kind of deprecated in a few places, like APIs, internal APIs, Zephyr APIs got bumped. So of course the, the uh, pull request, the work in progress pull request didn't follow. Uh, so uh, if you want to see how it looked like, we extracted from the big uh, chunk of code a smaller one. Uh, the link there actually uh, points you to the initial pull request, the first one that, that was adding the uh, very very core stuff uh, for the first board we we start with that was uh, EFR BG EFR 32 BG 22 SOC uh, and the Thunderbolt uh, board. So um, this is a typical initial pull request to be honest. Like uh, it, it adds pin control driver because it kind of need it. Uh, it adds some timers and so on configuration for the boards. Uh, it adds uh, UART driver because you know. At least you would like to have a uh, hello world working with with the first pull request. That that kind of uh, that's kind of useful if you uh, if you have the board. Uh, and um, um, so we did that, and we follow like a standard uh, procedure of like a, uh, you know review, update, review, update, uh, update the, the the code that reviewers pointed out, uh, fix the issues push, rebase, and so on and so on, and uh, eventually it got merged, uh, so we could proceed with, with the rest of the stuff. But before I jump into the rest of the stuff, I wanted to tell uh, a few things, what happened there, and, and what else you, we had to uh, take care of and, and, and figure out. So since that wasn't um, like a just hobbyist work, it was a you know, work for uh, Silicon devices, uh, Silicon Labs. <laughs> uh, to add new devices. Uh, uh, we had to take care uh, about a few things. So once we landed the first, uh, first stuff, people started using it. And uh, people who started using it uh, were already uh, Silicon Labs uh, uh, customers, but also new people that uh, just, you know, uh, found the code and said, oh yeah, awesome, finally I can use Zephyr with this board, so let's do it. Um, and of course, those people started to have uh, um, a bunch of requests. Uh, what should be added, how it should be added, or maybe how things should be tweaked or hacked so it works better with, with their code. Uh, but at the same time, we had to uh, fulfill the contract and, and the agreement with Silicon Labs and basically uh, work according to the plan and basically plan for the next uh, boards, the next families, and the next uh, 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 the next chips in this family. Uh, so we couldn't really, you know, listen to every single request and just immediately implement it, uh, but uh, rather uh, carefully explain, you know, what's where, why it's like that, uh, and, and so on and so on. So, uh, that that required some some uh, some additional work here. Uh, the other thing we had to take care of, uh, I mentioned that before, is licensing. So, as I said, uh, many uh, vendors, many many uh, code in the, uh, many platforms in Zephyr from many vendors uses something that is called hardware abstraction layer. So this is typically. Uh, code base that is delivered from some kind of a software development kits from the vendors. Uh, so it is either extracted or published somewhere on, uh, uh, on GitHub uh, and then imported to Zephyr project. Uh, so main Zephyr actually uh, uses that links against and builds it and links against it. Uh, so once, I mean, uh, if it is used uh, only with a uh, proprietary uh, software from the vendor or some bare metal software from the vendor, uh, the licensing 
can be custom, can be proprietary, because typically you have to accept the proprietary license to use the, the rest of the pods. But if you want to use it with Zephyr, you cannot really have a proprietary license there, because uh, the whole Zephyr project uh, has its uh, own permissive uh, license, and the rules in Zephyr say that you cannot really uh, merge into Zephyr anything that is not uh, on OCI approved uh, license. So. Here in how, when we carefully analyze it, uh, we figure out that some of the files there that we need to use uh, are uh, on uh, uh, Silicon Labs EULA, uh, so end user license agreement. Uh, so we had to basically do the audit there, go through all the files, figure out what's where, what is needed, and then, of course, uh, run it through legal teams, uh, realize that, and then release it. Uh, it wasn't really hard per se uh, to figure out what is where and what is wrong, but really, really, really necessary and really important in the end, because if you build product on a, uh, on a code that is on a wrong license, you may have problems in future. Yeah, so, so that was a really, really important step. Uh, but getting back to the technical work, um, if you start working on a new platform, um, you uh, have this first step where you basically add some first code, yeah, so, so to, to run it. Uh, so at some point you get it compiled, you get all the configuration in place, you, you get a binary, you load it to a board, and nothing happens. Uh, so what now? Uh, of course, you can grab some debuggers if you have one, uh, like hardware debugger, connect it to the board, run GDB, and just uh, figure out what the hell is happening there. Uh, but fortunately, that's not the only uh, way. Uh, you can use simulation, and actually, we have an uh, open source simulation framework called Renode. You may have heard of it. If not, uh, you can visit our booth or talk with us. We can show you. Uh, so basically, that one at the point where we are, we were working with uh, with this board was actually supporting EFR32 family, so we could use it to run. Uh, the code. And within simulation, it's super easy to figure out, like, uh, it doesn't work because, for some reason, stack pointer is allocated uh, outside writable memory, for example, yeah, or things like that. Or like a uh, mm, linker script puts something in wrong uh, places, or, uh, you know, interrupts are uh, registered incorrectly, and thing, all those things. So, mm, basically, with uh, with simulation, it's super easy to, to figure that out. And there is one uh, thing that you have for free in the end. Once you run everything in, uh, in simulation, actually, Renode is used as a part of, of Zephyr test system. You can uh, contribute your tests. So when you start working on additional features, you automatically have regression tests for, for, uh, for the base stuff. And if you want to try it out, it's super easy. Uh, basically, you copy those two comments, and with the internet here, if you're using uh, Wi-Fi here, it takes around two minutes to download everything, and you get uh, EFR32 uh, EFR BG22 uh, simulating um, Zephyr uh, console uh, sample running on your machine. Basically, this is the binary, uh, exactly the same binary as you could, uh, if you have the board, you can upload it to the board, you will get the same result. Uh, so feel free to try. Uh, you can, as I said before, you can download the PDF, PDF from uh, of this presentation, just copy those two lines. If you have Linux, uh, this will work with Linux only. I haven't tried, to be honest, uh, with, with any other system. <coughs> okay, um, so I mentioned before that besides Zephyr itself, the core work in Zephyr, we also build and maintain like environment around, and one of these uh, projects around is a uh, is Renode dashboard. So since we had already uh, simulation ready, like simulation platform, simulation framework that supports the board, so once we added the board, the, the you know, support for the board, it immediately popped up in, uh, in Renode, uh, sorry, in dashboard. So uh, if you follow the link there, you can simply see like the whole uh, page for EFR32 BG22. Uh, and you know, with all the tests there, with uh, traces for those tests, with uh, uh, binaries that you can download and run, with uh, UART outputs recorded, and so on, so on. So pretty cool. Uh, and that kind of was for free, uh, because you know, uh, uh, we already had the rest. Once we contributed Zephyr support, it popped up. and. Um, uh, since we, uh, you, if you 
if you attended the uh, keynotes yesterday and Michael's presentation, Michael showed uh, one of the projects we also work on. This is like a hardware uh, visualization, visualization stuff. Uh, and since we were working with, with Silicon Labs uh, boards, we thought, like, why not grab their Gerber files and run it through the flow. Uh, we'll see what happens, and that one happened. This is a visualization of the board, uh, like automated, automatically generated from uh, from uh, uh, from the Gerber files using the flow that we use uh, for generating our open hardware portal with components uh, like 3D components that are free available, like open source. Uh, available, you can you can download them. That was a, just a side task, but it's pretty cool. I mean, you can use it either for like the generating documentation automatically, for example, in Zephyr, but also for uh, generating some marketing materials like uh, you know animations of those boards and so on, so on. Um, but that's uh, enough topic. Like, uh, pretty cool. I mean, it looks, looks really nice. Uh, I just want to brag with it. Uh, so, getting back to to the main topic. Um, once we had the base support, um, we could start on uh, adding the rest, adding the uh, rest of the of the functionality. And there is a lot of other stuff to be added, like you know, uh, drivers for peripherals, for radios, and so on, and so on. So again, you cannot really get like one PR adding uh, the base stuff and the second one adding the rest, because the first comment you get. Please split it, uh, and you would get it from many, many, uh, many, many maintainers. Because if you suddenly open a PR to many subsystems, GitHub will automatically ping maintainers of every single subsystem, and they will tell you, "Oh, come on, please split it." Uh, so uh, you have to, uh, you have to, you have to do it like one by one. Um, it's kind of overhead, but but you know that's the only way to go, and the only way that is actually. Uh, maintainable in the end. Uh, of course, with adding uh, some uh, new drivers, you may need to add something to the hardware abstraction layer, and every time you merge one, you may need to rebase the others because they may cross be, be cross dependent. So uh, that's the theory, how it works in practice. If you want to take a look, this is the example of the flow for we did for. Uh, BG22, so you know a bunch of PRs uh, adding the drivers or extending the support one by one. You will see there like rebases, comments, and stuff like that. So we can just follow uh, the links and see how it works. It's not that we had to write all the drivers; some of them were already there. Uh, we just may need to, uh, needed to tweak them, enable them. Sometimes you know add uh, new Pinmox IEPI uh, and, and stuff like that. So. Uh, you can, you can simply follow those uh, those links and uh, and get them. Um, with so many pull requests, sometimes cross-dependent, uh, you can be hit with uh, Zephyr recycles. Uh, so Zephyr follows pretty well-defined recycle. If you want to know more about it, you can uh, check the documentation. You can also click this link here and see the dates of the next releases. One was like. One release was like a week ago or two weeks ago, something like that. Uh, so uh, the releases are not problem per se in, in merging things, uh, unless you want to have your specific piece of code in certain release. Uh, the problem here is that every release uh, is preceded by something called feature freeze, where no new features are merged. So only pull request fixing stuff, or uh, you know improving the stabilization, or coverage test coverage and stuff like that. But no no new features, uh, and you know adding new platform is a new feature. So you won't be able to land that. Uh, and but if you have a timeline, you need to fit in because you, you know your customers uh, require certain certain features at a certain point of time. You have to plan for that. Um, it is well documented, so you need to just know the schedule and know what, when to start. Uh, also, attending the meetings, especially TSC meetings, after TSC meetings, there's a public meeting, uh, is, is helps you to, to actually get uh, up to date with, with what's happening and where to start. Um, OK, uh, I wanted to talk specifically about uh, wireless support here, because wireless support was actually one of the 
biggest thing, uh, things here. The rest is a microcontroller with certain peripherals that are needed there. You need to have, you know, I2C, you need to have SPI, and then you are, uh, you know, interrupt controller, stuff like that. Uh, but um, the cool thing about the EF432 uh, family is, um, is that it's super low power. I will talk about power management in a moment, and it has a radio, and the radio provides, uh, uh, allows you to, to you know, uh, to, uh, to basically, you know, connect wirelessly to, to, to other devices. Uh, so this one supports BLE, ZigBee, Fred, and some proprietary protocols. Uh, but here in this project, BLE, uh, so Bluetooth Low Energy, was uh, uh, the highest priority. Um, Zephyr already has open source BLE stack, which is pretty cool. Uh, and Anders actually mentioned uh, about it. Uh, but many vendors, including Silicon Labs, have their own uh, they own stacks, they own radio drivers, things like that, and those are typically uh, provided as a binary blob, so we don't have the code, you just have a binary blobs. Uh, there is a way to land it, I will tell about it uh, in a moment in Zephyr, um, but uh, we wanted to like, uh, land as minimal amount of, of binary code in Zephyr as possible. So since there is an open source BLE stack, we just needed the low-level stuff. Uh, so we did like uh, some, some research how we can lend only this and figure out that yeah, we can lend only the library for low-level for Phi stuff and just use open source uh, BLE stack. Uh, and if you want to lend, add additional Binary to uh, binary blob to Zephyr. Uh, there is a path for that. It's well documented. Uh, as you can read through it, uh, read through it in the documentation. Uh, so basically, you need to uh, open an, an issue, open a PR, uh, pointing to that, explaining you know uh, what's the binary, where is the binary, what's the license, what it does, uh, escalate it to TSC. So. Uh, it's do the voting, and then you can land it. Uh, later, once the binary is there, updating it is way easier, you just update it. Uh, but adding new one at this point looks like that. And once you have it, you can uh, you know, land everything, and, and the support is complete. Uh, you have, uh, you have, all the, you have the, whole the, the whole platform there in place. Um, so once we did it, uh, Silicon Labs could tell the customers, like, everything is there, uh, just try to use uh, Zephyr right now. Yeah? You, you can grab Zephyr, you will have the whole functionality there in place. And that's true. So, uh, people who typically earlier used, uh, some of the you know, customers, they were explicitly asking for Zephyr, so they were convinced, yeah, they wanted to use Zephyr, but some of them not. Uh, some of them were using uh, bare metal for their whole life. So, uh, you know, you start hearing typical questions of uh, how does operating system, like way complex, more, more complex operating system like Zephyr compared to my simple bare metal application. Yeah, so uh, typically questions about code size, uh, portability, and, and power efficiency. So in terms of code size, uh, it's really hard to compare. I mean, Zephyr is highly configurable. It's not that easy to actually uh, do apple to apple comparison between Zephyr and bare metal, yeah? Uh, especially if you're using uh, binary blobs. Uh, I mean, binary blobs are basically grabbed and linked, so you cannot do much about it uh, within Zephyr, but you also cannot do much about it in, in bare metal, so basically you get what it is and then link with what it is there. <coughs> um, so code size is tricky. Uh, when it comes to portability, Zephyr is super portable. I mean, you can even build it for to run on your local machine like a native x86 Linux PC and test your algorithm. So, you know, Zephyr wins like on, on every single front here. But power efficiency is something that uh, is the hard question, yeah? Is Zephyr's power management as good as my super handcrafted uh, bare metal power management. And especially, you know, when, he, when we talk about uh, those uh, BG uh, EFR32 second series uh, uh, chips, they are known for being super power effective, yeah? So, so uh, super low power and, and, and so on. So uh, that's a very, very uh, valid question. So um, we started looking into that uh, and then, uh, you know, preparing answers for, for people who ask that. Uh, so, uh, 
contrary to your bare metal uh, implementation, Zephyr power management flow is kind of generic. I mean, the same flow applies to every single, uh, every single board there, every single target there. Yeah, so um, it works in a way that. Uh, uh, the scheduler checks if there is something to be, uh, something to happen, and if it's not, we just go to the deepest uh, sleep state as we can. Yeah, so so we just try to save as much energy as uh, uh, as we can, um, and certain pieces of code, certain drivers or certain, sub certain subsystems, can uh, mark f uh, can tell the power management uh, code that uh, please. You know, do not go to into deep sleep uh, while I am transmitting, for example. Yes, so, so uh, the the lowest possible mode right now is just you know, like a uh, eye link, nothing else. Yeah, you cannot go to sleep. Yeah, you cannot uh, like um, disable CPU, for example. Yes, so, so uh, this is how how it is uh, how it works. In the end, it, of course, it has to have like a custom implementation for for certain family or certain uh, uh, SOCs or, or, or like even uh, uh, single chip. Um, so there is a place to implement your custom code. If you have something more sophisticated, this is the place. Or you can simply you know, call like a, you know, uh, uh, turn off everything, turn off clocks and, and wait for interrupt. Um, Okay, so we started looking into that, and the first test was like a uh, super tragic. Uh, we ran bare metal application was drawing something around with Bluetooth uh, beacon uh, example. Uh, so bare metal was drawing something around uh, 100 microamps, and Zephyr was drawing uh, like 20 times more. Um, so that was super tragic. Uh, of course, it wasn't exactly apple to apple comparison. I mean, we were running beacon here and there, but with different stacks and so on. But still, 20 times difference is like uh, no, it's not acceptable. Uh, so the first issue was kind of obvious. The default configuration wasn't really even enabling power management. So uh, with in Zephyr, we were just running full steam ahead. That explains a lot. Um, so we, we enabled uh, power management config in the default configuration for the board, and we dropped down to around 170 microamps, uh, which is way better, but still twice as much as uh, uh, as, as the uh, bare metal application. So that. Um, uh, Figuring out that took a bit more time than figuring out that okay we didn't even enable power management uh, in the original uh, uh, in the original uh, uh, configuration. Um, it turned out that um, uh, the per metal uh, uh, implementation actually does something that we called uh, partial wake up. So it can go to a very deep sleep, but then wake up to a uh, like a power level or energy level two, instead of you know enabling the whole CPU and so on, uh, do like a, a checks on the radio, and if there is something to to process, uh, wake up the rest. Yeah. So uh, we ported that uh, to to power management to Zephyr's power management and get the same results. Like you know, the differences was uh, mm -hmm. the differences were uh, like single microamps. So. You know, probably you know test equipment uh, errors. Um, so uh, there is some more work planned and some next steps planned. I think uh, Anders will tell more about it. You should probably next? use that one. Yeah. What, what are we doing next? We have just started, as I said, and uh, we got our first two ports out. Uh, I've been very excited of what we have heard uh, here at the conference. Uh, I, I think cloud is uh, given to be added to our uh, implementation. Uh, for some reason, someone asked me yesterday, where, where's the Wison implementation in Zephyr? And last night, uh, the guy for Wison said, why aren't we doing a Wison implementation in Zephyr? So I guess we have the, the hands raised to do it. Uh, Matter, I see as a given. Uh, it goes along with um, uh, 
uh, the, the open source concept, so that is an easy one. Uh, well, sorry, I said easy one. I'm a, I'm a marketing guy. It's easy for me. Someone else is going to do it, as you know. But uh, I, I think that's a pretty given one as well. Uh, our Wi-Fi SOCs needs to run uh, um, Zephyr as well, and that's the port we're working on right now. Uh, and, of course, we need to do more boards oh, and all our devices in there. Uh, so that's a little bit of a bigger job than it sounds. It's not, just not to add boards because that's a repetitive way of doing it. We need to get our database that describes all the SOCs and boards implemented so that we can generate all boards, all target devices, etc. So I think with that end, Right now, uh, we are working with uh, Ant Micro on this. We will continue working with Ant Micro on this. I do foresee that we internally will get more uh, resources added to help Ant Micro uh, to get all this done. But I do not foresee that we uh, are going to take it over and run all of the porting, etc., ourselves. So this is a tool for us. Uh, and uh, our expertise is more on, on creating stacks and, and other things. So, so I think with that we can close the presentation and start seeing if there are any questions. Yeah, there is first one there. So um, it, why, why can't we program the, uh, the radio directly through registers? Why, why do we have to go through a blob? Because you're you're not the only one doing this. Uh, ST is doing this, and you know if we, I, I, we are doing our own uh, IoT protocol uh, directly on two FSK on both two four and eight six eight, and it's just annoying. Um, uh, I share your annoyance. Uh, I have spent two years trying to get uh, the Ray library open sourced. Uh, I'd be super honest with you guys, and uh, we, when we did our transceivers, the SI4460 series, uh, these have, I think it's 200 registers that you need to get some kind of track of to be able to get them to do what you want, and that's pretty simple. Uh, in this new radio, uh, we are getting closer to 2,000 registers, 32-bit. The radio is originally designed for uh, 802.15.4, so uh, pretty slow data traffic. And you know, in 802.15.4, I send something, maybe I get a reply, you reply tomorrow. Uh, BLE is a little bit more strict, uh, so there is a lot of um, uh, code in the Ray library that are making sure that we reaching the timer requirements of BLE. And then there is a lot of other funny things that engineers like to do, and uh, they don't want to document it, uh, <laughs> of course. So um, they, let's say that it's a question of investment. Uh, do we want to open this? Then we need to start um, uh, documenting, and that's going to take some time. On the other hand, we also see that uh, now we're talking about Series 2. Uh, series 3 will be totally different. It will not have a uh, ray layer at all. So uh, that the radio will run on its own core, uh, totally separated, and you will have your application core, like in the uh, Wi-Fi chipset we're, we're doing now. So uh, the question is, is it worth doing that investment? Me personally think so, because we are still foreseeing at least another five, six years where Series 2 is the high runner that people will design with, and then we see another five years where anyone designed with that the family of devices continue doing their designs. So, uh, yes, I, I hear you. I will forward it. I will use it uh, <laughs> as ammunition internally. But I, I, let me say that I, I'm fighting big powers here. <laughs> I think you have time for one more question. One more. Make, make a good one now. That, I didn't say that was a bad one. That's a good one. I want another good one. <laughs> Uh, along the same lines, uh, so I did a little bit of work with the uh, Zephyr Bluetooth stack, and I, I know that there's the uh, HCI layer, but then there's also the split level, split low level stack. When you refer to Zephyr's BLE stack, are you referring to the split low level stack, or to the HCI layer? To HCI, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just that's the interface we're using uh, for, for doing the BLE. And the, so the, 
that's a big discussion we have about the BLE because if you're using our BLE stack, you will have a lot of other um, uh, functionalities like AOX, uh, HADM, and all these things. But I, we have, we might integrate our stack into Cepher later on if there is a need for it. But where we wanted to start was to use as much as possible of the Cepher project because otherwise it doesn't make really sense. So since we're out of time, uh, I will be up in the Ant Micro booth. Uh, if there is anyone that wants to fight over a few of the kits that we have, it's the XG24 up there, uh, because I know you all want to test our solution right now. Uh, they are up in the booth. If you have more questions, uh, let's meet in the booth and talk about it. And uh, thank you very much for um, uh, attending our uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.